Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everyone. This week, Joseph and I are going to engage in uh, something that we've done a number of times, which is to unpack a fairy tale. Uh, Lisa is traveling abroad, and it occurred to us to take a look at Puss in Boots. There's been a wonderful uh, animated film called Puss in Boots Last Wish with um, Antonio Banderas and a whole star-studded cast that has been very popular, uh, not only among children, but especially around, among young people. And so we started wondering what it was about this particular fairy tale that has really emerged again and recently, and in a very big way, in the culture. So something's up. So let's listen to Joseph, who will wend us through the tale as it was written by the Brothers Grimm. And the tale has been around for a really long time. It had shown up in the Italian Renaissance in the 1500s, and something about the story has just stayed alive and moved from culture to culture, and of course, has such an interesting uh, renaissance here in the United States, capturing our imagination. So this is the Brothers Grimm version. A miller had three sons, a mill, a donkey, and a cat. The sons had to grind grain, the donkey had to hold the grain and carry away the flour, and the cat had to catch the mice. When the miller died, the three sons divided the inheritance. The oldest received the mill, the second the donkey, and nothing was left for the third but the cat. This made the youngest sad, and he said to himself, I certainly got the worst part of the bargain. My oldest brother can ride wheat, and my second brother can ride his donkey, but what can I do with a cat? Once I make it a pair of gloves out of his fur, it's all over. The cat, who had understood everything that the boy had said, began to speak. Listen, there's no need to kill me when all you'll get is a pair of poor gloves from my fur. Have some boots made for me instead, and then I'll be able to go out, mix with the people, and help you before you know it. The miller's son was surprised the cat could speak like that. But since the shoemaker happened to be walking by, he called him inside and had him fit the cat for a pair of boots. When the boots were finished, the cat put them on. After that, he took a sack, filled the bottom with grains of wheat, and attached a piece of cord to the top, which he could pull to close it. Then he slung the sack over his back and walked out the door on two legs like a human being. At that time, there was a king ruling the country, and he liked to eat partridges. However, recently the situation had become grave for him because the partridges had become difficult to catch. The whole forest was full of them, but they frightened so easily that none of the huntsmen had been able to get near them. The cat knew this and thought he could do much better than the huntsmen. When he entered the forest, he opened the sack, spread the grains of wheat on the ground, placed the cord in the grass, and strung it out behind a hedge. Then he crawled in back of the hedge, hid himself, and lay in wait. Soon the partridges came running, found the wheat, and hopped inside the sack, one after the other. When a good number were inside, the cat pulled the cord. Once the sack was closed tight, he ran over to it and wrung their necks. Then he slung the sack over his back and went straight to the king's castle. The sentry called out, Stop! Where are you going? To the king, the cat said. Are you crazy, a cat to the king? Oh, let him go, another sentry said. The king's often very bored. Perhaps the cat will give him some pleasure with his meowing and his purring. When the cat appeared before the king, he bowed and said, My lord, the count, um, he uttered a long, distinguished name, sends you his regard and would like 
to offer you these partridges which he recently caught in his traps. Well, the king was amazed by the beautiful fat partridges. Indeed, he was so overcome with joy that he commanded the cat to take as much gold from his treasury as he could carry and put it into the sack. Bring it to your lord and give him my very best thanks for the gift. Meanwhile, the poor miller's son sat at home by the window, propping his head up with his hands and wondered why he had given away all that he had for the cat's boots, when the cat would probably not be able to bring him anything great in return. Suddenly the cat entered, threw down the sack from his back, opened it and dumped the gold at the miller's feet. Now you've got something for the boots. The king also sends his regards and best of thanks. The miller's son was happy to have such wealth, even though he didn't understand how everything had happened. However, as the cat was taking off his boots, he told him everything and said, Surely you'll have enough money now, but won't be content with that. Tomorrow I'm going to put on my boots again, and you shall become even richer. Uh, incidentally, I told the king your account. The following day, the cat put on his boots, as he said he would, went hunting again, and brought the king a huge catch. So it went every day, and every day the cat brought back gold to the miller's son. At the king's court, he had become a favorite, so that he was permitted to go and come and wander about the castle wherever he pleased. One day, as the cat was lying by the hearth in the king's kitchen and warming himself, the coachman came and started cursing. May the devil take the king and the princess. I want to go to the tavern and have a drink and play some cards. By now they want me to drive them to the lake so that I can go for a walk. But when the cat heard that, he ran home and said to his master, If you want to be a rich count, come with me to the lake and go for a swim. The miller didn't know what to say. Nevertheless, he listened to the cat and he went with him to the lake. He undressed and jumped into the water completely naked. Meanwhile, the cat took his clothes, carried them away, and hid them. No sooner had he done that, the king came driving by. Now the cat began to wail in a miserable voice. Oh, most gracious king, my lord went for a swim in the lake, and a thief came and stole his clothes. They were lying on the bank, and now the count is in the water, and I can't get him out. If he stays much longer, he will freeze and die. But when the king heard that, he ordered the coach to stop, and one of his servants had to race back to the castle and fetch some of the king's garments. The count put on the splendid clothes, and since the king had already taken a liking to him because of the partridges that, he believed, had been sent by the count, he asked the young man to sit down next to him in the coach. The princess was not in the least angry about this, for the count was young and handsome and pleased her a great deal. In the meantime, the cat went on ahead of them and came to a large meadow where there were over a hundred people making hay. Who owns this meadow, my good people? asked the cat. The great sorcerer. Listen to me. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of the meadow is, I want you to answer, the count. If you don't, you'll all be killed. Then the cat continued on his way and came to a wheat field, so enormous that nobody could see over it. There were more than 200 people standing there and cutting wheat. Who owns this wheat, my good people? The sorcerer. Listen to me. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of the wheat is, I want you to answer the count. And if you don't do this, you'll all be killed. Finally, the cat came to a splendid forest where more than 300 people were chopping down all large oak trees and cutting them into wood. Who owns this forest, my good people? The sorcerer. Uh, listen to me. The king will be driving by, and when he asks who the owner of the forest is, I want you to answer the count. 
and if you don't, you'll all be killed. The cat continued on his way, and the people watched him go. Since he looked so unusual and walked in boots like a human being, they were afraid of him. Soon the cat came to the sorcerer's castle, walked boldly inside, and appeared before the sorcerer, who looked at him scornfully and asked him what he wanted. The cat bowed and said, I've heard that you can turn yourself into a dog, a fox, or even a wolf, but I don't believe that you could turn yourself into an elephant. That seems impossible to me. Well, and this is why I've come. I want to be convinced by my own eyes. Well, that's just a trifle for me, the sorcerer said arrogantly, and within seconds he turned himself into an elephant. Oh, that's great. Uh, but can you also turn yourself into a lion? Oh, nothing to it, said the sorcerer, and he suddenly stood before the cat as a lion. The cat pretended to be terrified and cried out, Oh, oh that's incredible and unheard of. Never in my dreams have I thought this possible. But you'd top all of this if you could turn yourself into a tiny animal such as a mouse. I'm convinced that you can do more than any other sorcerer in the world, but that would just be too much for you. The flattery had made the sorcerer quite friendly. And he said, Oh, no, dear cat, that's not too much at all. And soon he was running around the room as a mouse. All at once, the cat ran after him, caught the mouse in one leap and ate him up. While all this was happening, the king had continued driving with the count and princess and had come to the large meadow. Who owns the hay? The king asked. The count, the people all cried out, just as the cat had ordered them to. You've got a nice piece of land, Count, the king said. Afterwards, they came to a large wheat field. Who owns that wheat, my good people? The Count. My, you've got a, what a large and beautiful estate. Next, they came to the forest. Who owns these woods, my good people? The Count. The king was even more astounded and said, You must be a rich man, Count. I don't think I've seen a forest as splendid as yours. At last they came to the castle. The cat stood on top of the stairs, and when the coach stopped below, he ran down, opened the door, and said, Your Majesty, you've arrived at the castle of my lord, the Count. This honor will make him happy for the rest of his life. The king climbed out of the coach and was amazed by the magnificent building which was almost larger and more beautiful than his own castle. The count led the princess up the stairs and into the hall, which was flickering with lots of gold and jewels. The princess became the count's bride, and when the king died, the count became king, and the puss in boots was his prime minister. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that our cat here is such a likely hero. He certainly is a trickster, but he's pretty ruthless. He has uh, no qualms about telling all those people in the wheat fields and the woods that, you know, do as I say or, or you'll all be killed. <laughs> I, I, no kidding, right? That's... Uh... There's something dark about Puss in Boots that I'm not sure it comes through yeah. in those children's uh, cartoons quite so clearly. I agree. The cat is an unlikely hero. Certainly he's a trickster. He's, he is amoral. He seems to be you know, pretty clear that he's in it all for himself. 
and I can get it at the beginning. He needs to save his life rather than have the miller's son turn him into a pair of gloves. Um, he's not content with the fact that he can get partridges and bring them to the king and come back with a sack full of gold every time. So he's power hungry and he's ruthless. So part of me wonders, is, is our puss really a psychopath? It is a, it is a fair question. And I think that if we think about nature in and of itself, you know, nature is not terribly sentimental. There's, there's an old phrase, you know, nature is red in tooth and claw. Yes. And I think, well, perhaps through cartoons and the sentimental feeling that we have about our pets, which, which I do as well, we have a tendency to, to tame nature, to, to think that nature is uh, sweet, and to have a kind of ideal Arcadian fantasy about nature. But boy, any of us that have spent any time out in nature, or frankly even seen your neighborhood cat actually play with a mouse, it is chilling. And it's the truth that this is how it is. So there, there is something about the cat, and I think it was probably a pretty transactional deal between human beings and cats way back uh, millennia ago, uh, that they weren't quite pets. They, were, they struck a deal. We'll make sure your house is not overridden with rodents, and you'll let us live inside and um, give us some treats, and it'll be a mutually beneficial relationship. These days, I think we like to uh, sentimentalize cats as our cute little kitty cats, and there are all kinds of, quote, designer cats um, that are fluffy and appealing. But this story lifts up just what you were saying, nature red in tooth and claw. I'm in it for myself, and I, I'm ruthless about it. He, he's not only willing to kill the mice, He's willing to kill hundreds of people working in the wheat fields and the woods. He is a survivor, as Mm -hmm. all animals are. I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I've never been a cat person myself. I'm more of a dog person, but I've had uh, friends tell me that they've had some domesticated cats who will encounter a mice and have no, have no response to it. That uh, we've bred cats out of being kind of working companions into being uh, dolls and pets. But this is a cat from like the 1600s. And this is, this is a working cat who knows how things go in the world and had been a part of the Miller's family as a rat catcher. So he already had established himself as a hunter, which is an interesting contradistinction between the agrarian world of the Miller where things are cultivated and uh, seasonal and reliable and transforming wheat into flour, etc. But the cat's the hunter-gatherer in that family and is connected to that much more ancient, primal world. The other thing that struck me in the tale is that the cat has um, something of an insatiable appetite. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you think? <laughs> I think. Particularly, it struck me as I was reading it, um, he throws a bag of gold down at the boy's feet, and he says, surely you'll have enough money now, but we won't be content with that. Tomorrow I'm going to go put my boots on, and we're going to get even richer. So the cat's the one who's got the ambition. Yeah, he's rapacious. And just to go back to, um, you know, sort of real world cats, it's a problem in a lot of places because cats, if they go outside, are killing songbirds. They are real hunters. They don't need them to eat, but it is bread in the bone, as it were. They see something fluttering, scurrying, and um, that predatory instinct is right there. Well, I think uh, we're probably thinking... uh Remembering the same uh, piece that came up in the news, that, you know, what is the alpha predator in the United States in terms of the most 
successful predator. And house cats, feral house cats, are the alpha predators. Most adaptive, most successful, most uh, f- fierce in their own way. And as you said, just decimating uh, populations of certain species. It's such a great depiction of of the the polarities. On the one hand, it's um, our precious little putty tat who comes in and cuddles up by the fire and wants to be have his ears rubbed uh, on your lap at night, and then out he goes. Um, he's a real Jekyll and Hyde kind of figure because he's out there, kill, kill. But you know, I am interested in the story of why this cat and that this cat wants a pair of boots. You know, you might think he'd like to have a jacket or, um, you know, some other thing, but no, he wants, he wants boots and they make him a human. He can then walk on his hind legs and the boots that he's depicted in, and I think really every version are really swashbuckling pirate style boots and they give him such a standpoint and such status there's something really metaphorically empowering about having boots there's also something uh, uncanny when I'm looking at it that the miller's son is going to turn the cat into a pair of clothing he's going to turn the cat into gloves and then the cat turns uh, around and says, "No, I, well, why don't we turn the, what, you know, one of the cows into a piece of clothing for me? So that the cat in that moment takes on some of those human qualities of the miller's son. And, and in a subtle unconscious way, I'm wondering if that's how the fairy tale is signaling that there is a relationship between the miller's son and the cat that that they have joined together as a as a psychic reality mm. that is, that are reflecting each other so there's another sort of heads and tails paradigm of like the cat that is tame and a pet and goes out at night to hunt uh, so we have the miller's son who bewails his fate and all he got was a cat and yet the other aspect of him is this ambitious, even rapacious uh, side of him that's going to go out there and get it. Right, so if we think of the miller who died, that he had three qualities that the sons inherited, as often happens, that a, a parent demonstrates certain capacities or has certain parts of their personality. And so there's one aspect of the father that is the mill, who is is able to transform something raw, as we said earlier, from wheat into flour, and and has a place in the community because everyone in the community brings their flour to the miller, uh, their grain rather to the miller, and there's a communal service as well as an industry in that. And milling grain was a kind of ancient discovery. If you eat grain, just right off the stalk, or if you dry it and try to eat it, you can't extract much nutrition out of it. So as human beings learned to dry and powder grain, it was an enormous boon for human civilization. And the advent of bread, for instance, was a remarkable Mm -hmm. advance in human nutrition uh, and the ability to thrive and survive. So it's a cultural adaptation and an inventive kind of skill. So that's part of the father. And then there's the donkey part of the father. You know, the beast of burden who follows the rules and has a life of servitude and hard work and drudgery, repetition, um, is prized only for his ability to be stubbornly robust in what's been assigned. But the father wonderfully has a third quality, which is this natural survival 
cunning instinct, which uh, Marie Louise von Franz associated with the feminine wisdom of nature. Hmm. I'm thinking about how many Millers there are in fairy tales. Miller's sons and Miller's daughters, uh, and that that place of a, a kind of centrality that everybody had to bring their grain to the miller. And Millers were famously sort of trickstery of, you know, they maybe held a little bit back for themselves of all the grain that uh, this, that, and the other person brought them. And how could you really tell if you were getting, you know, a fair measure? And so I, I like your um, analysis of those three qualities that are represented by the Miller's sons. And that trickster quality is right there, uh, represented by the cat, who, interestingly enough, has no name throughout this whole story. You know, he does not get called Pussy. He, he does not get called Kitty Cat. Um, he's just the cat that sort of archetypal <laughs> reality of qualities, ambition, uh, and ruthlessness, and a, a real predatory and even, we might say, greedy nature. Absolutely. He is the survivalist, mm -hmm. which all human beings have in themselves, Yeah, and that this boy needs, that this young person needs to have some some impulse to survive and take risks and try strange things and the first skill that puss in boots demonstrates is that skill of hunting that he was a hunter of rats in the mill house and now that he's attached to the boy he's the hunter of partridges as we had said there their capacity to hunt birds is uh, remarkable. And any of you that have seen uh, cats hunt, you know, they, they hunt like tigers, you know. They're incredibly soundless and stealthy and this hyper-focused quality. It's, it's amazing. And unlike other domesticated animals, cats will kind of uh, concede to let you care <laughs> for them. Uh, but they really remain in that liminal space between absolute wildness and some willingness to be uh, domesticated. What interests me in the tale, I'm going back to this cat becoming somewhat humanized uh, with his boots and his ability to speak and plot this uh, ruse to trap the partridges and, and the people he's He's all of a sudden really been elevated beyond uh, his inherent instinctual nature to a, a kind of consciousness, of a manipulativeness. And I'm thinking about this tale overall as a kind of witty thumbing its nose at convention. Mm. Of the tone of the tale says, you know, and good for the cat, you know, go, go, cat, go. Uh, rapaciousness is okay. Ambition is fine. Or as Janis Joplin famously saying, get it while you can. And um, it's a real endorsement of transgressive power grab. That opportunistic mm -hmm. survival drive and machiavellian uh, amorality this is the world you live in and it echoes the cat the cat you know he sees a mouse and he will will catch it he sees a bird and he wants to kill it and is this the world we live in and is this part of why puss in boots has really surged back into our culture as such a popular story is it, you know, one of those stories of every man for himself, um, and this is really how the world works, and it's fun. It's an adventure, and go for it. The caveat emptor, you know, <laughs> let the buyer beware. Like, if somebody can get your stuff away from you, then you, you're enough of a rube that you deserve to not have it any longer. Mm -hmm. And the cat's 
attitude towards the sorcerer is just ruthless. Uh, just takes everything from him, kills him, supplants this uh, probably knucklehead boy, you know, uh, in head of all of this. It's chilling if, you, if we're really thinking about it. So again, I'm thinking about it uh, just that way. It is chilling, but there is a sort of attitude, a kind of sass that mm -hmm. says, here, you know, upper class people, take that and take this. Uh, I'm going to turn the tables on you. And it's going to be kind of covered up um, in the spirit of this wonderful great romp and uh, a kind of poetic justice and the delight of seeing a cat in boots, and the cat can do all this. So we all think it's funny. But it is undergirded by this kind of Machiavellian self-interest and power drive. The cat is the one that <laughs> drives the whole thing. You'd think that he could just keep bringing partridges to the king and get a sack of gold every couple of days, which would go pretty far in those days. But no, our, our cat is not satisfied until he gets to the top. And unlike that fairy tale about the fisherman and his wife, where the fisherman's wife gets uh, her way through the magical fish that's a prince in disguise or being transformed, uh, she goes from a little hovel by the sea to a townhouse to being queen, and she finally wants to be God, and then kaboom! Back she is at, in her hovel by the sea. This tale ends very differently. Of See, it all works. You can be ruthless and win. I was really uh, attending to what you had said, Deb, and the uh, subversion of the social order, which I think was such an important part of the French Revolution, and also this incredible pain you know, between the peasantry and the landed gentry. And it must have been so gratifying <laughs> as a fairy tale to to imagine that, that something as lowly as a cat and as lowly as uh, the youngest son with no inheritance could, through cunning, attain all of the opportunities that the upper class had and the... Mm -hmm gentry had. So when we think about the French Revolution and the overthrowing of all of that royal mm -hmm. hierarchy, we think of our own American Revolution and, and the Americans being kind of scrappy cats, you know, in their own way, you know, fighting for autonomy and, and also taking the uh, perhaps ill-gotten gains from the royals and moving them out into the peasantry, although I have to say the irony, if I were to put that lens on it, the irony is that there's no sense that the prince then becomes magnanimous or lifts the state of the other peasants, but the prince simply replaces <laughs> the old royalty with himself and just takes it for himself. There really is not a transformation of the social order. Yeah, the overturning uh, part, um, I have to go here. This is like a tale of the underdog. Oops, I mean the undercat. Um, <laughs> who who, uh, who wins and where he gets the best is, of course, he gets the best of the miller's son but because he drives his own cat career, as it were, uh, th through the miller's son. He, he's basically using this kid to become prime minister and get ahead. And of course, he also fools the king. And he wins over all the people in the court. The cat can now come and go as he pleases, lounge around by the fire if he wants. So there, there is this wonderful element that could well be related to the lower class, as it were, uh, thumbing its nose at the upper class. Of, oh, yes, you're the king, and, and um, my master is a count, and oh, I, I am absolutely uh, loyal to all of these social strata, and oh, your majesty, and really just 
pulling the wool over his eyes. In, in terms of the archetype of the trickster, which Jung was interested in, and we as Jungians uh, have have a lot of curiosity about, that the trickster, in one way, is the instinctive demand for life to progress. Mm-hmm. That when life becomes intractably difficult, whether that's literally in the forest or whether it's living in an oppressive governmental system, that a tricking instinct rises up to make sure that life can sustain. So whether that's you know a Venus flytrap plant that has a sticky honey and then it closes itself over a fly so it can digest it or the trigger fish that has a fake little worm appendage dangling off its nose to draw little guppies close to it so it can gobble them up that the demand to stay alive brings forward tricking qualities i'm old enough to remember the iron curtain And one of the ways that people survived in the tremendous oppressive communist system was to create a vibrant black market. That uh, life and the, the need and desire to live and thrive finds ways behind the rules to make sure that life can sustain. So some of the characteristics of the Trickster archetype is tricksters often intelligent and very cunning. Tricksters are highly adaptable. They can put on costumes. Some of the tricksters, like Loki, transform into different creatures back and forth. That the tricksters are ambiguous, just as you had said, morally ambiguous. Yeah. And that they are subversive in most cultures and most uh, fairy tales and myths. And in this story, what we see uh, with, with Puss is are all those qualities you just delineated here, Joseph, but also Puss is not human. He is, after all, as we've been talking about, he's a cat. And so he hasn't really achieved, despite all his material successes, any real full measure of humanity, real measure of a kind of consciousness that takes into account the impact on others, uh, what's, what's really right. There's a way that he's just unconsciously in pursuit of advancement, wealth, and status, um, but he's not related. And, and so this side of our Miller's son despite seemingly outer world successes, uh, is really not all that evolved. The consciousness has really not been attained, and certainly there is no Eros. The Miller's son marries the the king's daughter, but again, that seems like just sort of a a pat kind of thing, that uh, this is what you do, and she's another conquest, another, um, another trophy. Oh, she might be one of the first trophy wives. There there you go. And we have no real sense of the princess's personality beyond she doesn't mind having the naked count next to her because he's nice looking. (laughs) So it's all very one-dimensional. Yeah. Perhaps the way a cat might see the world. (laughs) You know, it's not terribly nuanced. And the king is also seems very childlike. Uh, You know, the... Miller's son and the king seem similar, and their needs are rather simplistic, and once he gets enough partridges, he's, the king seems kind of like a happy baby. doesn't seem to know about this enormous estate that's within a carriage ride of his own kingdom. It's like he's never been here before. Clearly he doesn't know anything about the sorcerer, or else he would have recognized this is his estate in this castle. So there's something so encapsulated and naive in the king as well. So there's this mirroring between the Miller's son and the king that they're they're really not very different aside from just their status and the trappings around them. 
right? No one has the capacity uh, for reflection. That they all just want uh, external world uh, benefits. The king wants his partridges. Um, his daughter, the princess, wants a handsome, comely husband. The cat wants uh, worldly wealth, status, power. Um, now, this is a fairy tale, and fairy tales are not noted for their, um, you know, really articulating uh, qualities like reflection. But, but this story, I think, is such a tale of the, the power drive, plain and simple, and that it ends, you know, like fairy tales all really do. They are, were intended to be encouraging and to provide uh, hope for you know, archetypal possibility, the possibility of individuation. And this tale is happily ever after. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, love or things coming out really right in the end. Uh, Snow White gets her prince. Uh, Cinderella's virtue and perseverance, you know, win her the true love. Uh, there's something heartwarming about these stories. You know, Little Red Riding Hood uh, gets the best of the wolf in the end, and so there's justice. But in this story, it's just all about creature comforts. I think I think that's quite so. I, I'm finding myself being curious a little bit about the character of the sorcerer, that the sorcerer in some way has some parallel relationship to the cat, that the cat and the sorcerer are both highly successful. Mm -hmm. The sorcerer has been able to create this castle. He has hundreds of servants doing these various tasks. I think that, particularly in the medieval world, calling somebody a sorcerer was saying that they were in league with the devil. You know, there was an enormous religious hostility towards anybody who seemed to be related to the old ways, the pagan ways, the magical ways. So I imagine that there was a certain justification in the minds of people who were hearing the tale that, well, of course you would take down the sorcerer, the witch, the non-Christian. So the sorcerer, I think, by implication, has somehow, through being in league with the devil, has been able to secure all of these wonderful resources, and then the triumph over the sorcerer in some ways implies this kind of a, this movement of Christendom, you know, into the assets. This is a very tiny, perhaps implied hmm. piece in the fairy tale, and that the sorcerer is not quite human because of his ability to transform into all manner of, of creatures. So there's a triumph over the supernatural, strangely enough, by a supernatural cat. But here the supernatural is in service to the ego. The cat is, in, is a loyal servant of the miller's son, albeit morally ambiguous. The sorcerer is a kind of magical agent that has no evidence of loyalty to something um, other than himself. So the parallel process here, which is very subtle, is that the cat supplants the sorcerer, but that is redemptive because the cat is the loyal servant. And this has something to do with the relationship between the ego and the unconscious, I suspect. That the unconscious is frightening in its almost magical, supernatural capacity and while it can evidence an enormous amount of power to be controlled by the unconscious can be very dangerous and problematic for individuals. That's really interesting what you just said, Joseph, that the sorcerer could symbolize a, a kind of uh, more instinctual level of how consciousness and unconscious relate. Uh, he was a shapeshifter, all of those things, and he had lots of land and a splendid castle and all that. But that put 
Phallus represents an advance of consciousness over the sorcerer. After all, Puss uh, tricks him into turning into a mouse and then ingests him, which can indicate, you know, taking something into consciousness in the literal way of, of eating it. So that's an interesting idea that there, there is an advance here of, of consciousness, albeit, you know, pretty much tied to the power principle, uh, status and wealth. Nonetheless, there it is. And the puss straddles the realms between being an animal and a human as he walks on his hind feet and he has boots. And heaven knows uh, he, he has a very uh, strategic mind. When we think of the Lord of the Rings, you know, Sauron represents, you know, this sorcerer who is serving only himself. And that in the arc of the story, Sauron must come under the rule of the king, the king of Gondor. Mm. And that archetypal theme that when the power of the unconscious is, is running rampant, doing whatever it wants, gobbling up everything so to submit or to uh, advance its will without regard for the concerns that the king represents this evolution of the ego or the queen for that matter the, revolu the evolution of the ego in its ability to navigate and mediate some of these incredible powers of the unconscious yeah, I think there's a lot to that. And uh, this fairy tale came on board uh, somewhere, what, around 14th, 15th, 16th centuries? But anyway, it was, it was a precursor to the Enlightenment, uh, which was about, you know, certainly great development of, of ego and rationality big shift from a, a mythical and religious archetypal orientation uh, to cognition, science, mind, and a big shift from collective uh, as, a, as a container and organizer to individual capability. I think that's a wonderful cultural context. And as von Franz and Jung noted in their work that there is this shift happening in the collective psyche that gives rise to collective dreams. Hmm. And those collective dreams and fantasies tend to be captured or create artifacts of themselves in fairy tales and mythology. Fairy tales being a bit more of a cultural transmission, myths being more of a religious transmission. Uh, it's um, interesting that it, myths and fairy tales arise from the collective unconscious. We don't create them, you know, sit down to write them out, because they tell us where and how the collective is undergoing transformation. And so it's interesting that this tale came along right at that particular time. It's not as ancient uh, as, let's say, Cinderella, which I think is a tale that is worldwide in different versions. This was about ego, ambition, transgression, achievement, and individual, the power that an individual represented by Puss can have. Use your wits. Get ahead. And the um, idea of the clever anthropomorphic cat still has this interesting little footprint you know the cheshire cat in lewis carroll's alice in wonderland it's a strange enigmatic um sarcastic <laughs> kind of creature there's uh, the cat in the hat from the dr seuss books sassy walking on two legs making rhymes <laughs> one way or another <laughs> It moves around, you know, in the back of our head. Um, and the other thing which is really funny is uh, if you go on YouTube and you, like, Google uh, talking cats, there's these thousands of people who've posted um, videos of their 
cat's meows that sound like particular words. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, just now, their vocalization well, sound uncannily human. Now, wait a minute, is, Joseph. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I get all this junk on my YouTube feed, um, which is hilarious and, and uncanny at the same time. So, so there's something in us wants our pets to be more human, perhaps, than they really are. It needs them to be in some way. I'm aware, too. Um, this has uh, sprung me into thinking about how uh, puss is very masculine, and cats have traditionally represented a lot of the feminine. Uh, Marie-Louise von Franz actually wrote a book about uh, a cat and how it, you know, the, the feminine kinds of qualities that cats have often traditionally uh, symbolized. A and here in this story, just as um, you know, enlightenment is on the cusp, it's on the horizon, it's coming your way, so is cat as masculine figure. This is um, no gentle, mysterious, lunar cat that walks in the night. This is a cat that's got a sword strapped to his belt, wears a pair of boots, this is in the movie, and has a great hat who uh, is out there all day, right in the daylight, doing his conquering thing. Absolutely. He's, he's uh, depicted now like one of the three musketeers a little bit more. Exactly. With a, That's perfect. A foil and a little swashbuckling mm -hmm. hat. But we also could say that the fairy tale may be predicting a shift in the feminine in the collective. Hmm. That for the feminine, this would be von Franz's thesis perhaps, that here in the fairy tale that the anima, the feminine principle in the miller's son, actually is not confined to what might be a traditional feminine representation, but that she can put boots on, that she can stride out there, that she has a voice, that she has instinctive capacities to hunt and achieve and uh, bring forward, which, as you said, we we might um, culturally find that a kind of a shifting of how the feminine presents. But but what if Puss in Boots in Shrek, for instance, which there was a Puss in Boots character as well as the recent movie, wore boots, had a sword and a hat, and still was a woman? still was associated with the dynamic energy of the anima. And of course, there's room for that as well. Yeah. It's interesting in the movie uh, Puss in Boots Last Wish that uh, while Puss is very definitely uh, male, he has a partner uh, who's as smart and capable and all the rest named Kitty. Uh, so, you know, there's certainly some momentum to balancing uh, these two archetypes that, and they have a dance fight. I mean, I, I have to say, I recommend the movie to everybody because it is just so delightful and the animation is amazing. But I'm thinking that these days, uh, just to have one uh, swashbuckling hero is not enough. It needs to be balanced with the archetype of, of the feminine. Also, a different kind of moral overlay. Uh, that the, the line, something like, it's never too late to do the right thing, and uh, you are more than this, you're better than this, overlays the whole thing, which is, you know, it's really a romp. It's, it's lots of fun with all kinds of fairy tale characters. Nevertheless, the mythology it has shifted even in this movie. And how wonderful that is, the way the, uh, culture conditions, the way the archetypes express themselves, and which brings us back to that wonderful differentiation that Jung makes between the archetype and the archetypal image, that the archetype is a kind of invisible matrix of potentials that somehow human beings 
have access to at one point Jung thought maybe these had to do literally with brain structures, but perhaps it's much more subtle than that now that we're leaning into quantum physics, but that the archetype activates and it presses upon the human mind at a given moment in a given culture. And then therefore it takes on different qualities as it moves into imagination and art. Hmm. So the Puss in Boots of this movie that was made last year and the Puss in Boots illustrations that were drawn back in the early 1800s all reflect ways in which the human imagination responds to the archetype. Just as the last little bit around archetypes is uh, one of the uh, authors, uh, Christine Downing, she has a, a book on um, feminine mythology, and she does reference Puss in Boots as a kind of echo from much more ancient mythology, because the cat was, as you said, uh, Deb, uh, an enormous figure in Egyptian uh, religion and mythology that uh, the Egyptian goddess Bastet, who was um, widely depicted uh, in Egypt, was the goddess of protection and fertility and motherhood, and that she was depicted sometimes as a domesticated cat as well as a lioness. And there's a way in which Puss in Boots does mother him. So in the story, there's no mother in the beginning. There's just the miller and his sons. The feminine principles mm -hmm. is not clear. It, it might be implied in as much as they... They mill grain, and grain is associated with Ceres and the fertility goddesses. But the feminine is very, very much missing. So the youngest son may also inherit the cat because that's a little bit of the mothering, caretaking principle of the psyche and in the mythology. So I think Downing has an interesting possibility there. She, she reminds us that cats and lions were associated with Artemis, the Greek goddess Artemis, and uh, the Hindu goddess Durga rides on a tiger, and she is the one who protects the faithful from adversity. Artemis, who was independent and untamed and connected to nature, also carries some of the qualities of Puss in Boots, and even in the Norse mythology, cats are associated with Freya, who's another kind of maternal figure. And Puss in Boots does, t does what she needs to do to take care of her boy. So that's <laughs> well, another possibility. Well, I don't know if I can really sign up for that, but I really like it a lot, <laughs> Joseph, that, um, you know, sort of uh, in disguise that the feminine element has nonetheless been imported into um, the story of Piss Puss in Boots. Well, there's, uh, it's always fun to go on and on about a, uh, a fairy tale, but uh, maybe it's time for us to take on a dream here. We are for sure going to bring in the feminine element because this is a dream um, that a woman who's 37 years old and is a translator has submitted. And here's the dream. I was in my childhood home, right in front of the back door of the kitchen. There, I saw what I now think was a fish tank right on the back door frame, but which looked like a small beach with clear waters and without a glass to separate it from the outside. Inside this tank, there were lots of small, white golden snakes. Outside of the water, I saw a lot of cats, some of them similar to pets I had had in life. I was taking care of them when suddenly I saw two cats fighting, one a black, small black male, which was young, and a big white female, which was old. 
A snake came out of the water and got tangled with them. I tried to separate the snake from the cats, but when I did that, the snake bit me on my left hand. I heard someone urging me to kill the snake, but I just put it back into the water. I washed the wound with clear tap water, knowing that the poison was not going to hurt me. To protect the cats, though, I somehow got rid of the snake's pond. I don't remember how, but I know it was easy. Then I, quote, heard the old white cat saying that the snake was not trying to hurt them. Then I woke up. And for context, she says, Nowadays, I'm a translator preparing to move to another country and for an in vitro fertilization. I'm taking a post-grad course in analytical psychology, too. Thanks for the podcast, by the way. (laughs) Uh, She says the main feelings in the dream were curiosity about the snakes in the water and the urge to take care of the animals, trying to protect them all, and tranquility. Uh, She also says, I'm a former biologist who loves animals, especially cats. I had pet cats all my life. The older white cat looks like a former pet of mine, now deceased. I do not fear the snakes in the dream. In fact, I admired them. Okay, well, here's a dream that certainly ties right in uh, with our subject for this week. So, um... Let's see what we can make of it. Well, lots of dreams begin, I'm in my childhood home. Yes. Much because we're often working out complexes that got installed in our childhood that none of us escape unscathed from childhood. It's part of just the developmental reality. And there's a sorting out of some kind that's happening in the proximity of the childhood that somehow is significant. It certainly is the case that a lot of dreams take place in my childhood home. And just as you said, that, you know, we're in that complex of the family complex uh, and the complexes that were instilled or installed in us as children. And, And she also says right in front of the back door of the kitchen. Oh, there's always so much in the dream setting. The back door often is a clue that something is coming in through the unconscious or something is coming through in an indirect way. It's not right out there uh, the way the front door is. And uh, the kitchen, which is uh, the hearth. And a lot of uh, kitchens have the back door in them or right outside the kitchen. Uh, And uh, so... Here's a wonderful kind of um, double image of you know, what comes into the central place in the home. Despite all our modern equipment, it still archetypally is the hearth. And then here is a fish tank brimming with, with life, with all these little small white golden snakes and cats. So I think of the kitchen also as... Um a place of alchemy, mm. because cooking is so remarkable. This is the hearth that, that keeps us warm. It's the heart of the home. We gather to be near the warmth. But fire and the mastery of fire and food and the various uh, uh, pots that we've created transform raw ingredients and make something delicious, something new, something that is nutritious happen. So it's you know, it's it's about change as well. Mm-hmm. When I was just thinking about that image of the the black male cat, the white female cat, so we have a polarity. The male and the female are there. There's a, an age difference, and that the snake, you know, writhes around them, which of course in real life would be disturbing. But the talking cat, much like Puss in Boots in the end, says, no, the snake was trying to do something else. And uh, before I had heard you um, mention that she's looking for an in vitro fertilization, Mm -hmm. snakes are often associated with sexuality. So this sexual dynamism is moving between the old cat and the young uh, masculine 
which seems like a deeply symbolic, powerfully symbolic capturing of the in vitro, the desire uh, to use in vitro fertilization to, to have a pregnancy. And the fact that it you know, it's, it involves a terrarium, you know, it's a prescribed you know, white vessel, you know, where all this is kind of contained a test tube, you know. I really resonate to what you're saying that uh, the, the kitchen is a place of transformation. We transform raw, inedible things into things that are warm and digestible. And this image um, of the two cats and a snake tangling up the two of them. And I wonder if it's sort of a unifying principle that the dream ego says, oh my God, this is horrible. Um, I better step in and try to do something about this. But I wonder if it is a, a symbol of the reconciliation of the opposites. And one is black, one is white, one is male, one is female, one is old, one is young, of combining and unifying the opposites. Uh, via this primal power of the snake. And b by the way, she says the snakes are small and white golden, uh, which indicates a kind of positive quality about them. You know, uh, let's say the snakes had been cobras. We might all be going, oh, yikes. But uh, these really seem to be... Um, you know, not frightening, and something, you know, really literally squirming with with life, um, hence fertilizing potential. Yeah, I think there's a dance hmm. between the archetypal activations and the desires that we experience in ourselves um, on a lived level. So... In one way, we can imagine that this individual, again, is seeking to, to get pregnant uh, through the in vitro. But from an Jungian standpoint, we're also you know, looking deeper and deeper and wondering what's activating on an archetypal level mm -hmm. this archaic part of the psyche that bubbles up and can inspire any number of different impulses at the level of personality. So the desire for the masculine and feminine to blend and create a, a new life mm -hmm. can look like many things, in, including the drive to have a biological child. Yeah. But the deep, deep, deep impulse is universal and can show up in many different endeavors. At some level, um, even our dream ego kind of gets it. Uh, she doesn't... Uh, follow the urge of someone to kill the snake. She just puts it back in the water. So back it goes into the source of life, which is water, ponds, ocean. It's generative. She doesn't think that the poison is going to hurt her. And at the end, she hears the old white cat, the feminine principle in this dream, saying the snake is not trying to hurt them. That the ego's attitude is uh, to protect the cats. Mm -hmm. But then something much more instinctive comes in and says, well, no, 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 there's another attitude we need to have about whatever the snake represents. So the unconscious is trying to change the perception of whatever the snake represents. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of sometimes the least trustworthy attitude is that of the dream ego. And uh, the dream ego is receptive. You know, we can hear that in a number of ways. That even though someone urges her to kill the snake, she doesn't. She puts it back into the water. And then she hears the white, the, uh, white cat uh, say that the snake is really okay. It seems as if the dream ego is has moved from... Uh, standard ego response of, oh my gosh, this is terrible, to, you know, wait a minute, um, maybe there's more here uh, than what it initially seemed. Uh, she's uh, w willing to take that in and willing to preserve the life of the snake. So there is something um, calm, thoughtful, mm -hmm. 
that when she separates them she's and puts them back in their separate realms, she's not aggressive, she's not trying to punish anything. Exactly. If we look at the beginning of the dream, or the middle of the dream, rather, I suddenly see two cats fighting, small black male, young, a larger white female, old. So that's the first interpretive moment there, and then the snake winding around them. So it is also possible that she is mistaking fighting, or she's mistaking mating for fighting. Uh-huh. And, and as in many species, that the mating dance and the mating process um, can be strange, ritualistic, even highly aggressive. I'm wondering if the dream is also asking her to reconsider what it looks like for the masculine and the feminine to come together, literally, to produce a child, but maybe figuratively, that there is a certain... Um, red dance, so to speak, Mm -hmm. that opposites will take as they try to find the relationship with themselves. And this may have some bearing on the unconscious tension around pregnancy. This dream is teeming with life uh, from all of the white golden snakes in the tank to the cats to the snake to the dream egos Uh, involvement in all that is going on. There is so much life moving around, and she's really wonderful about tending and protecting. The last bit I'm curious about is because the snake bites her, and again, I'm in this fantasy that it has something to do with an unconscious dynamic around the in vitro fertilization, is that um, often women are injected with um, HCG, um, which is that... um, follicular stimulating hormone to produce uh, eggs. So there is an injection of something which then stimulates ovulation, which then participates in the in vitro fertilization. So while we don't want to interpret this purely as a reflection of the fantasy of the in vitro, it is has it, it does have something to do with the ambivalence about this magical process of becoming pregnant, I suspect, and these archetypal dynamics that have to be understood and embraced in order for, at least on that energetic level, for things to make sense and and feel acceptable. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.